Welcome to St. Timothy Lutheran Church on this 17th Sunday after Pentecost. We're so glad that you could join us for our online worship this week. Because this week, we hear a story about greatness. And I want to give you a heads up to think about something ahead of time that we'll get to in the sermon. But I want you to think about someone great. Hmm. It's the only qualification, just someone great, knowing all the while that whoever we have in our minds, and I have one too, Jesus might upend our expectations of greatness. So come with us on this journey with Jesus through song and prayer and scripture as we learn to live the love of Christ greatly with one another. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But by the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding. As servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hey friends, we have a children's sermon here today. And this is a special children's sermon for what we're celebrating this weekend at church. On Sunday, we're celebrating Bible Sunday. So if you're in a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a third grader or a fourth grader or a sixth grader or a seventh grader, you're going to be getting a Bible at the Sunday service. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my Bible. All right, when I was your age, I was given a Bible that actually looks a lot like the ones we have in the pews here at church and had my name in it and the date in which it was given. And that's actually at home. But here at church, I have this Bible. This is the Bible that I read in my office, and maybe you might see me carrying it around. And some of you have asked me before, hey, Pastor Dan, have you ever read the whole Bible? Now, that's a long book. And do you know what I say? I say, well, yes and no. Because truth be told, I think I've ever read the whole Bible cover to cover. And you know what? The Bible's not really meant to, or not supposed to be read cover to cover. Because unlike most books that start at the beginning and tell one story and then come to an end as you turn the final page, the Bible is a little different of a book. There is one story, one story about humanities, our relationship with God. But in the Bible, there are many people who, go to, who get to tell that story in many different ways. There are songs and poems and great battles and adventures, and sometimes it's just people's random thoughts. And over time, I've probably read most, if not all of it, and I have a few favorite I love the story of Jonah and the whale. 
I love the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but maybe that's just because I enjoy hearing a story about my namesake. I love the stories about Jesus and the stories that Jesus tells about vineyards and plants and sheep. And so when you get your Bible, and if you've already received a Bible here at church, I want you to open it up. You don't have to start at the beginning. I want you to open it up find a favorite story of your own. And when you have that story, I want you to share it. Share it with your parents. I'd love to hear because it's a story about our relationship with God. I'm so excited that we get to put these Bibles into your hands and that you get invited into that great, great Amen. The first reading is from James, starting with the third chapter. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, glory to the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, glory to the Lord. Alleluia. Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right, I want you to take a moment and picture a great person. Who comes to mind? What makes them great? I wonder if any of us are thinking of the same person. It seems unlikely. I mean, there are many people in the world that could be considered great, according to traditional definitions of the word greatness. And there are many areas of life for greatness to reveal itself. 
right? There's greatness on the courts or on the, you know, on the sports field. There's greatness in the classroom. There's greatness in hospitals and operating rooms. There's greatness in the arts, musicians, actors, writers. There's greatness in almost any field of life, cooking, fishing, even politics. Now well, here's who immediately came to my mind. And I think this is because I most recently read a book, a biography by Eric Larson of Winston Churchill during the London Blitz, right? It's called The Splendid and the Vile. And it's, it's clear from the actions that the British Prime Minister took during the early years of World War II that he is a great person, a great leader. Churchill stood firm and fast in the defense of his island nation as it was continually bombed and bombarded from the sky. He provided truly great leadership during what could have been England's darkest hour. And yet, the great wartime leader for much of his life was not very great. Up until the war, he was mostly a failed politician in both of England's dominant political parties. He was incredibly in debt, indulging his expensive taste to beyond excess. At times was a, a distant father, a heavy drinking, often irritable fellow whose greatest trait could really just have been his, his stubbornness. But he's who I thought of. And in most senses of the word, great fits our definition of greatness. But like all people, even the great ones that you have in mind, he has his fair share of not great things, too. And then there's the example of greatness Jesus puts forward. And unless your great person hasn't gone to kindergarten yet, none of us probably picked Jesus' example of an unequivocally great person. For Jesus... Greatness is a child. I mean, this is just like Jesus, to toss out our preconceived notions, to upend the ways we think, to make us look at the world in a totally new way, to shake conventions and our very human expectations when it comes to who and what is great. We do not know what qualifications the disciples were using to argue who was the greatest. But we can probably guess that it was closer to our human definitions of greatness than Jesus's. Maybe one disciple made the argument for being the greatest because he was with Jesus the longest. Maybe another because he gathered the most followers. Perhaps it was Peter because he had a cool nickname, The Rock. Perhaps it was Judas, because he got to carry all of the money. What we do know is that there came a point where Jesus had heard enough and needed to set the record straight. He sat them down and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child held it up as an example of not only what greatness looks like, but what God and all of God's greatness and grandeur looks like too. So what's so great about a child? Why didn't any of us think of a preschooler when we thought of a great person? And why would Jesus say that a child is an embodiment of the greatness of God? I mean, if we used our own standard definitions of greatness and probably the standards the disciples were arguing about, accomplishments, excellence in any given field, money earned, fame bestowed, the only greatness captured by a grade schooler might be uh, Mozart, right, who made his first comp musical composition at age five and his first symphony at nine. But let's face it. When most children create great works of art, they most likely end up on the fridge or in the trash rather than the Louvre. 
true greatness, Jesus says, is not about being first or in a museum, but actually about being last. And in the ancient world, there was no lower status than that of a child. Children in Jesus' time were very vulnerable. They were completely dependent on others for their survival and well-being. Child mortality rates were so high that until a child came to age, people did not place much hope in them at all. Even today, a child is perceived least in many ways. Least in stature, least in age, least in ability, least in success and experience. And yet, because of all of these leasts that we can ascribe to children, what is left is only the greatest great of them all. Because there's one thing that a child does that is truly the greatest. Children love the greatest. I mean, little children only desire one thing, love. Both to love and to be loved. A little baby does not care how much money you make or how many books you have read. A little child does not care what car you drive or how much you spend at dinner. And sometimes it's quite the opposite. A baby wants you to work less hours, eat more boxed mac and cheese and hot dogs, and for you to put down your book or your phone and pick them up in your arms. Maybe this happened to me today Maybe it didn't, but if you want to get a shower to start your day and head off to work, they will stand right outside the shower curtain just to be close to you. Like I said, maybe that happened today. When a little child wakes up in the middle of the night, it's not to fret about their 401k or how high their SAT scores are. They cry because the people they love are not close by. And sometimes we roll our eyes or try to reason with them because we don't have time or energy to indulge in all of that love. Right? No, daddy needs to go to work. Or daddy's reading the news right now. Or daddy has to go into the world and try to be his greatest today. But a little child is a reminder that the greatest thing I could do in that very moment is to sit down with her in my lap and make as many farm animal noises as I can. Little children are a reminder that when we first came into this world, all of us, from the queen of England to the, the poorest of paupers, could never make it on our own. Least of all, do anything we think is great. Instead, we need someone to love us and to take care of us and to teach us and to hold us when we are sad and to dry our tears when we cry and to feed us when we are hungry. And so when we take a child into our arms, just like Jesus did. Holding a vessel of human love and nothing else, we finally get a glimpse at the greatest thing in the entire universe. Our human ideas of greatness melt away, and we glimpse the love and greatness of God. And six months from now, late March, I'm happy to share with all of you that Kendra and I get to welcome into this world another reminder <laughs> of what true greatness really is. Amen. <laughs> Be your servant.
made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of community, we pray for the church in every land and place. Unite us in our great love for you and for each other. We pray for this congregation of faith, for all the children who received their Bibles this weekend, and for our members, especially Jason, Michelle, Lucas, Isaac, and Ethan Marsden, Bruce, Helen, and Audrey Maxson, Betsy, Ryan, Annie, and Cora McIntyre, Andy, Amy, Catherine, and Abby McKenna, and Michael, Heather, Audrey, and Nolan McLean. Gracious God, God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us a new desire to care for this world that you have made. Help us to reach out in care and prayer for those people who are suffering in any kind from natural disaster, from earthquake or fire or flood. Gracious God. God of cooperation, we pray for the nations of this world embroiled in conflict. Inspire leaders to listen to each other and work towards your peace. Protect the vulnerable, Lord, especially children who cannot find safety in their home or country. Gracious God. God of comfort, we pray for all those in need. We pray for those who are ill this day. Bring wholeness and healing, especially to Brian Vickery, Maria Garcia, Joni Berkeley, Bob Hoare, Larry and Tony Hansler, and Wilhelm Lintz. Gracious God. God of all consolation, we give you thanks for our loved ones who have died and pray for all who grieve today. Shine your grace that they may receive the promise of your eternal life. Gracious God, receive these prayers, O God, those we speak out loud and those known only to you in the silence of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right 
our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The risen Christ invites us to this table, come, eat, and be satisfied. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. And receive now the Lord's blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us. Be upon you now and forever. Amen. Good morning, friends. Thank you so much for being with us again for our online worship service. Hey, we had a joyous weekend last weekend of celebration as we brought back our fall schedule with um, Sunday school. We received new members. We celebrated First Communion with some of the families and children, and it was just such a wonderful, joyous time to be back together once again. So I hope you can plan on being with us in the future for some of our um, in-person services if you're able. So if you stay on the line for a few minutes here, you're going to be able to see highlights of what we did last week. So it'll be fun for you to, to kind of catch up and see what's been happening at the church. 
Also, Hesed House is the end of this month, so you can check the website for more information about that and um, see how you can help with that very important ministry. And one last thing before we leave today, um, following up on Bishop Curry's meeting with our congregation in August regarding the resignation of Pastor Miller, the church council and our staff will be inviting you to a listening and a processing session if you need to come and be with us. Um, we have partnered with the mental health professionals at Grow Wellness Group who will guide our gatherings. So you'll have an opportunity to come Monday, September 20th, either at 2 p.m. for a listening session or that evening on September 20th at 7 p.m. And these will take place in our church sanctuary. So um, there's no reservation needed. You just come and we do ask that you wear a mask um, if you plan on attending, if you feel the need. Um, and if you have any questions regarding that, you can contact the church office and we'll be happy to tell you more information about that. So that's a lot. So until then, have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next week online. Thank you. Bye-bye. People of St. Timothy, what have we been called to do? Go in peace, serve the Lord.